Good morning, friends. We are on part two, chapter five. Simon had vanished. A morning came and he was missing from work. A few thoughtless people commented on his absence. On the next day, nobody mentioned him. On the third day, Winston went into the vestibule of the records department to look at the notice board. One of the notices carried a printed list of the members of the chess committee of whom Simon had been one. It looked almost exactly as it had looked before. Nothing had been crossed out, but it was one name shorter. It was enough. Simon had ceased to exist. He had never existed. The weather was baking hot. In the labyrinthine ministry, the windowless, air-conditioned rooms kept their normal temperature. But outside the pavement, scorched one's feet in the stench of the tubes at the rush hours was a horror. The preparations for hate week were in full swing, and the staffs of all the ministries were working overtime. Processions, meetings, military parades, lectures, waxwork displays, film shows, telescreen programs all had to be organized. Stands had to be erected. Effigies built, slogans coined, songs written, rumors circulated, photographs faked. Julia's unit in the fiction department had been taken off of the production of novels and was rushing out a series of atrocity pa pamphlets. Winston, in addition to his regular work, spent long periods every day in going through back files of the Times and altering and embellishing news items, which were to be quoted in speeches. Late at night, when crowds of rowdy proles roamed the streets, the town had a curiously febrile air. The rocket, the rocket bombs crashed oftener than ever, and sometimes in the far distance there were enormous explosions which no one could explain and about which there were wild rumors. A new tune, which was to be the theme song of Hate Week, the Hate Song it was called, had already been composed and had been endlessly plugged on the telescreens. It had a savage, barking rhythm, which could not exactly be called music, but resembled the beating of a drum. Roared out by hundreds of voices to the tramp of marching feet, it was terrifying. The proles had taken a fancy to it, and in the midnight streets it competed with the still popular It Was Only a Hopeless Fancy. Parsons' children played it at all hours of night and day, unbearably on a comb and a piece of toilet paper. Winston's evenings were fuller than ever. Squads of volunteers, organized by Parsons, were preparing the street for hate week, stitching banners, painting posters, erecting flagstaffs on the roofs, and perilously slinging wires across the street for the reception of streamers. Parsons boasted that Victory Mansions alone would display 400 meters of bunting. He was in his native element and as happy as a lark. The heat and the manual work had even given him a pretext for reverting to shorts and an open shirt in the shorts and an open shirt in the evenings. He was everywhere at once, pushing, pulling, sawing, hammering, improvising, jollying everyone along with camaraderly exhortations, and giving out from every fold of his body what seemed an inexhaustible supply of acrid smelling sweat. A new poster had suddenly appeared all over London. It had no caption, it repre and represented simply the monstrous figure of the Eurasian soldier, three or four meters high, striding forward with expressionless Mongolian face and enormous boots, a submachine gun pointed from his hip. From whatever angle you looked at the poster, the muzzle of the gun, magnified by the foreshortening, seemed to be pointed straight at you. The thing had been plastered on every blank space on every wall, even outnumbering the portraits of Big Brother. Proles, normally apathetic about the war, were being lashed into one of the one of their periodical frenzies of patriotism. As though to harmonize with the general mood, the rocket bombs had been killing larger numbers of people than usual. One fell in a crowded film theater in Stepney, burying several hundred victims among the ruins. The whole population of the neighborhood turned out for a long, trailing funeral which went on for hours and was in effect an indignation meeting. Another bomb fell on a piece of waste ground, which was used as a playground, and several dozen children were blown to pieces. There were further angry demonstrations. Goldstein was burned in effigy. Hundreds of copies of the poster of the Eurasian soldier were torn down and added to the flames, and a number of shops were looted in the turmoil. Then a rumor flew around, th flew around that spies were directing the rocket bombs by means of wireless waves, and an old couple who were suspected of being of foreign extraction had their house set on fire and perished of suffocation. In the room over Mr. Charrington's shop, when they could get together, Julia and Winston lay side by side on a stripped bed, under the open window, naked for the sake of coolness. The rat had never come back, but the bugs had multiplied hideously in the heat. It did not seem to matter. Dirty or clean, the room was paradise. As soon as they arrived, they would sprinkle everything with pepper, 
who would sprink ev sprinkle everything with pepper bought on the black market, tear off their clothes and make love with sweating bodies, then fall asleep and wake to find that the bugs had rallied and were massive for the counterattack. Four, five, six, seven times they met during the month of June. Winston had dropped his habit of drinking gin at all hours. He seemed to have lost the need for it. He had grown fatter. His varicose ulcer had subsided, leaving only a brown stain on the skin above his ankle. His fits of coughing in the early morning had stopped. The process of life had ceased to be intolerable. He had no longer any impulse to make faces at the telescreens or shout curses at the top of his voice. Now that they had a secure hiding place, almost a home, it did not even seem a hardship that they could only meet infrequently and for a couple hours at, ta at a time. What mattered was that the room over the junk shop should exist. To know that it was inviolate was almost the same as being in it. The room was a world, a pocket of the past where extinct animals could walk. Mr. Charrington thought Winston was another extinct animal. He usually stopped to talk with Mr. Charrington for a few minutes on his way upstairs. The old man seemed seldom or never to go out of doors, and on the other hand, to have almost no customers. He led a ghost-like existence between the tiny, dark shop and an even tinier back kitchen where he prepared his meals, and which contained, among other things, an unbelievably ancient gramophone with an enormous horn. He seemed glad of the opportunity to talk, wandering about among his worthless stock with his long nose and thick spectacles and his bowed shoulders in the velvet jacket. He had always vaguely the air of being a collector rather than a tradesman. With a sort of faded enthusiasm, he would finger the scrap of rubbish or that, a china bottle stopper, the painted lid of a broken snuff box, a pinchbeck locket containing a strand of some long-dead baby's hair, never asking that Winston should buy it, merely that he should admire it. To talk to him was like listening to the tinkling of a worn-out musical box. He had dragged out from the corners of his memory some more fragments of forgotten rhymes. There was one about four-and-twenty blackbirds, and another about a crow with a crumpled horn, and another about the death of a poor cock-robin. "'It just occurred to me that you might be interested,' he would say with a deprecating little laugh whenever he produced a new fragment. But he could never recall more than a few lines of any one rhyme. Both of them knew, in a way, it was never... Both of them knew, in a way, it was never out of the, their minds, that what was now happening could not last long. There were times when the fact of impending death seemed as palpable as the bed they lay on, and they would cling together with a sort of despairing sensuality, like a damned soul grasping at his last morsel of pleasure when the clock was within five minutes of striking. But there were always times when they had the illusion of, the illusion not only of safety, but of permanence. So long as they were actually in this room, they both felt no harm could come to them. Getting there was difficult and dangerous, but the room itself was sanctuary. It was as when Winston had gazed into the heart of the paperweight, with the feeling that it would be possible to get inside that glassy world, and that once inside it, time would, could be arrested. Often they gave themselves up to daydreams of escape. Their luck would hold indefinitely, and they would carry on their intrigue just like this for the remainder of their natural lives. Or Catherine would die, and by subtle maneuverings, Winston and Julia would succeed in getting married. Or they would commit suicide together. Or they could, or they would disappear, alter themselves, out of recognition, learn to speak with proletarian accents, get jobs in a factory, and live out their lives undetected in a back street. It was all nonsense, as they both knew. In reality, there was no escape. Even the one plan that was practical, that was practicable, suicide, they had no intention of carrying out. To hang on from day to day and from week to week, spinning out a present that had no future, seemed an unconquerable instinct, just as one's lungs always had to draw the next breath so long as there was air available. Sometimes, too, they talked of engaging in active rebellion against the party, but with no notion of how to take the first step. Even if the fabulous brotherhood was a reality, there still remained the difficulty of finding one's way into it. He told her of the strange intimacy that existed or seemed to exist between himself and O'Brien and of the impulse he sometimes felt simply to walk into O'Brien's presence, announce that he was the enemy of the party, and demand his help. Curiously enough, this did not strike her as an impossibly rash thing to do. She was used to judging people by their faces, and it seemed natural to her that Winston should believe O'Brien to be trustworthy on the strength of a single flash of the eyes. Moreover, she took it for granted that everyone, or nearly everyone, secretly hated the party and would break the rules if he thought it safe to do so. But she refused to believe that widespread, organized opposition existed or could exist. The 
tales about Goldstein and his underground army, she said, were simply a lot of rubbish which the party had invented for its own purposes, and which you had to pretend to believe in, times beyond number, at party rallies and spontaneous demonstrations. She had shouted at the top of her voice for the execution of people whose names she had never heard of and in whose supposed crime she had not the faint she had not the faintest belief. When public trials were happening, she had taken her place in the detachments of the, from the Youth League, who surrounded the courts from morning to night, chanting at intervals, Death to the traitors! During the two minutes' hate, she always excelled all, she always excelled all others in shouting insult to Goldstein. Yet she had only the dimmest idea of who Goldstein was, and what doctrines he was supposed to represent. She had grown up since the Revolution, and was too young to remember the ideological battles of the fifties and sixties. Such a thing as an independent political movement was outside her imagination, and in any case, the party was invincible. It would always exist, and it would always be the same. You could only rebel against it by secret disobedience, or, at most, by isolated acts of violence such as killing somebody or blowing something up. In some ways, she was far more acute than Winston, and far less susceptible to party propaganda. Once, when he happened in some connection to mention the war against Eurasia, she startled him, startled him by saying casually that, in her opinion, the war was not happening. The rocket bombs which fell daily in London were probably fired by the government of Oceania itself, just to keep the people frightened. This was an idea that had literally never occurred to him. He also stirred a sort of envy in him by telling him that, during the two minutes' hate, her great difficulty was to avoid bursting out laughing. But she only get she only questioned the teaching of the, of the party when they came when they in some way touched upon her own life often she was ready to accept the official mytho mythology simply because the difference between truth and falsehood did not seem important to her she believed for instance having learnt it at school that the party had invented airplanes in his own school days winston remembered in the late fifties it was only the helicopter that the party claimed to have invented a dozen years later, when Julia was at school, it was already claiming the airplane, one generation more, and it would be claiming the steam engine. And when he told her that airplanes had been in existence before he was born, and long before the revolution, the fact that struck her was totally uninteresting. After all, what did it matter who invented airplanes? It was rather more of a shock to him when he discovered from some chance remark that she did not remember that Oceania, four years ago, had been at war with East Asia and at peace with Eurasia. It was true that she regarded the whole war as a sham, but apparently she had not even noticed that the name of the enemy had changed. I thought we'd always been at war with Eurasia, she said vaguely. It frightened him a little. The invention of airplanes dated long before her birth, but the switchover in the war had happened only four years ago, well after she was grown up. He argued with her about it for perhaps a quarter of an hour. In the end, he succeeded in forcing her memory back until she had, did dimly recall that at one time East Asia and not Eurasia had been the enemy. But the issue still struck her as unimportant. Who cares, she said impatiently. It's always one bloody war after another, and one knows and one knows the news is all lies anyway. Sometimes he talked to her of the records department and the impudent forgeries that he committed there. Such things did not appear to horrify her. But she did not feel the abyss opening beneath her feet at the thought of lies becoming truths. He told her the stories of Jones, Aronson, and Rutherford, and the moment, momentous slip of paper which he had once held between his fingers. It did not make much impression on her. At first, indeed, she failed to grasp the point of the story. Were they friends of yours, she said. No, I never knew them. They were inner party members. Besides, they were far older men than I was. They belonged to the old days, before the revolution. I barely knew them by sight. Then what was there to worry about? People are being killed off all the time, aren't they? He tried to make her understand. This was an exceptional case. It wasn't just a question of somebody being killed. Do you realize that the past, starting from yesterday, has been actually abolished? If it survives anywhere, it's in a few solid objects with no words attached to them, like that lump of glass there. Already we know almost literally nothing about the revolution in the years before the revolution. Every record has been destroyed or falsified. Every book has been rewritten. Every picture has been repainted. Every statue and street and building has been renamed. Every date has been altered. And that process is continuing day by day and minute by minute. History has stopped. Nothing exists except an endless present in which the party is always right. I know, of course, that the, p the past is falsified. But it would never be possible for me to prove it, even when I did the falsification myself. After the thing is done, no evidence ever remains. The only evidence is inside my own mind, and I don't know with any certainty that any other humans, human beings share my memories. 
just in that one instance in my whole life I did possess actual concrete evidence after the event, years after it. And what good was that? It was no good because I threw it away a few minutes later, but if the same thing happened today, I should keep it. Well, I wouldn't, said Julia. I'm quite ready to take risks, but only for something worthwhile, not for bits of old newspaper. What could you have done with it even if you had kept it? Not much, perhaps, but it was evidence. It might have planted a few doubts here and there, supposing that I dared to show it to anybody. I don't imagine that we can alter anything for our, in our own lifetime, but one can imagine little knots of resistance springing up here and there, small groups of people banding themselves together and gradually growing or even leaving a few records behind, so that the next generation can carry on where we leave off. I'm not interested in the next generation, dear. I'm interested in us. You're only a rebel from the waist downwards, he told her. She thought this brilliant, brilliantly witty and flung her arms around him in delight. In the ramifications of party doctrine, she had not the faintest interest. Whenever he began to talk of the principles of Ingsoc, doublethink, the mutability of the past, and the denial of objective reality, and to use newspeak words, she became bored and confused and said that she never paid any attention to that kind of thing. One knew that it was all rubbish, so why let oneself worry by it? Why let oneself be worried by it? She knew when to cheer and when to boo, and that was all that was that one needed. If you persisted in talking of such, such, of such subjects, she had a disconcerting habit of falling asleep. She was one of those people who can go to sleep at any hour and in any, in any position. Talking to her, he realized how easy it was to present an appearance of orthodoxy while having no grasp whatever on what orthodoxy meant. In a way, the worldview of the party imposed itself most successfully on people incapable of understanding it. He could be made to accept the most flagrant violations of reality because they never fully grasped the enormity of what was demanded of them, and were not sufficiently interested in public events to notice what was happening. By lack of understanding, they remained sane. They simply swallowed everything, and what they swallowed did them no harm because it left no residue behind, just as a grain of corn will pass undigested through the body of a bird. Have a good day, friends.